if you have uh, any question during the seminar, please write in the chat area on the hand icon, which you okay on the right side of the microphone. Ricky, please, the microphone is yours. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Arye. Uh, hello, good evening here in Israel. And thank you all for joining us uh, on this webinar. Um, Arye, before I, we continue, Mickey uh, wrote something, I don't know, like record, record, record not on. It is so, working, it is working, okay. okay. Uh, it is working, okay, fine, fine, okay. So can we please upload the presentation? Okay, so um, before we begin, uh, this presentation is a part of information literacy course, which we uh, is held here, here uh, in Moffett Institute. Um, the, inf the information literacy course intend to teach uh, how to search, access, and retrieve information sources. Uh, we will talk in this course about information search, basic and advanced techniques, uh, especially search the invisible web, uh, multimedia search, ebooks, e-commerce, uh, economic information. Um, very useful uh, course, I think, and uh, we recommend it. We will talk about it uh, again in the end of this uh, webinar. So what we're going to see today, um, we're going to talk about the concept of open access, um, some basic strength of the open access movement, the, of the world of open access. Um, I think the main idea is uh, to teach you how to search and retrieve uh, the open access materials from the researcher to the computer, uh, meaning we'll go to the especially uh, websites and uh, we'll see how to retrieve information from it. Um, we'll talk about copyright and if you can use and how you can use uh, the articles you find there. Uh, I would like also uh, to mention the free academic courses uh, like open courseware and MOOCs. Um, and in the end, we'll talk about open data, uh, which is a new subject and very popular these days uh, among uh, researchers, uh, especially in, um, in natural sciences, but also now in uh, humanities and um, social sciences. Okay, so uh, what is open access? So the definition says uh, resources that are openly available to users with no requirements for authentication or payment. Um, meaning you can actually look for uh, um, academic materials, but not only look for it because, uh, you know, Google Academic, uh, Google Scholar does it uh, also. He search for academic material. But the thing is that you can here also retrieve what you see. So if you find an article and you think it's good for you and for your research, all you have to do is just click on the full text and you upload the full text, which is amazing because, you know, usually you have to go inside uh, the periodical or the book and you have to pay uh, to the publisher in order to read it. Not you, probably your institution, your library. But here we talk about something else, something that came um, from the researchers researchers themselves, uh, so you can find and retrieve the, what they wrote without need to pay or to authenticate. Uh, so no one knows if you use it or not. Uh, I, I put here a, also a, a link from the Cornell University, which explains, I think, better, but we won't go through it now, but I'll leave it to you later. So let's try and look on a, a movie, the first one. Uh, I'll just uh, try to upload it for you. Just a minute. Open data, no, which is... <laughs> just a minute. I uploaded like tons of movies here, so... <laughs> okay, like a Murphy. I can't find the, the exact one, so I'll do it now. Just a minute. Oh, 
Okay, I'll try to upload it for you. Okay, let's hope everybody sees it. Okay, hope you could hear it as well as I did. Um, so uh, we talked about open access and okay, and the potential of it. Um, so when we talk about the open access, uh, I think in a few words, we can say that uh, it is digital, online, free of charge and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Um, works are still covered by copyright law. We'll talk about it in a minute. But open access terms apply to allow sharing and reuse of the information that you find. All major open access initiatives for scientific and scholarly literature insist on the importance of peer reviewed, meaning you can trust what you see, you can trust what you read. It's exactly uh, like you retrieve things from a periodical that you know or use. So why, <clears throat> why to publish in open access? Well, for authors, it means that when you publish in open access, you publish quality material and you can use it for career advancement, meaning that a lot of people can look for your uh, article, they can read it, they can cite it. Uh, it, is much, it is much better than the one you, um, you publish through a periodical. The indexing is very good, uh, not only for Google Scholar, but also in the um, search engines that we will uh, try to look later. Copyright, again, uh, we'll talk about it, but in a few words, um, you, you can um, uh, allow people to use your article, but uh, as long as they cite you and give you the credit, uh, it is peer reviewed, meaning if you uh, use the open access, you cannot avoid peer reviewing it. So uh, the quality will be as good as um, the orthodox way of publishing. Um, you can print it, you can preserve it, like download it and save it. And of course the prestige, your prestige as, a hot, uh, as an author uh, grows up because more, more people can use your article and cite it. So for authors, as you can see, it is very um, profitable. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about the authors before we go on, um, when you publish an, an article, when you publish an article in a, in a periodical, you have to sign to the publisher, isn't there a problem with open access articles that you need to pay for it? Uh, okay, well, uh, yes, there is, but I'll talk about it in a few minutes, okay? Uh, first, let me, okay, uh, first let me um, say that when you uh, publish in um, an article, um, you have to um, allow the publisher to use it as, uh, as for, well, as they like, and it is not your copyright, so you cannot download it or, no, you cannot publish it by yourself. You have to sign that uh, the only way people can read your article is by uh, reading it through the periodical. Of course, today we have a lot of in entrepreneurs like uh, ResearchGate that you can publish the preprint and try to do things, well, not the orthodox way, but still it is uh, not the uh, open access that I talk about. 
Uh, okay, and, and to your question, Erez, well, there are periodicals that allow you, there are publishers that allow, allow you to publish your uh, article through their um, platform, but you have to pay uh, so people can uh, read it open access. But I'm talking here uh, about another uh, uh, suggestion. I'm talking here about periodicals that are dedicated to open access, so that the uh, uh, that the publishers are not involved in the in uh, this area. So you can publish it through a periodical that um, uses open access. It is not part of the publishers, and we'll talk about the publishers and their hegemonic later. Okay, so. Um, Let's go on. Okay, this is another uh, very nice thing about uh, this lecturer that um, uses the open access and try to, pr uh, to promote it. Um, there is a big movement, uh, researchers movement um, to use open access. I'll just show it to you Oops. in a minute. Okay. This one, okay. Okay, so let's watch the next one about an open access movement. Let's see if it's working. Open access movement, yeah. Play. Okay, so um, the, like I said, this movement is very popular uh, and we'll see some data later about the statistics of how many of our data or of the um, uh, academic um, material is open access today. Um, well, it's important to know that open access is not open source, which applies to computer software. It is not open content, which applies to non-scholarly content like data, um, governmental data, municipal data. Uh, it is not, as I said, open data. I'm moving to support sharing of research data. We'll talk about this later. 
Um, and it is free access with no charge to access and all right may be reserved like, uh, like we explained before. So, um, well, Erez asked uh, us uh, a few minutes ago, um, why do you have, uh, well, about the payment? Well, sometimes the authors prefer to uh, publish their articles in the orthodox uh, periodicals and yes, they pay. Now, uh, where, where do they pay it from? Well, some governments just fund this payment uh, in order for their researchers to, um, to publish in open access. Uh, some have um, the organization to support, them, to support them, but if not, it is very, very, um, it's, it's a lot of money uh, if you want to publish uh, open access. So you need to go to the other way, like I mentioned before, uh, to go to the uh, periodicals that does open access um, freely, uh, not con uh, connected to any uh, uh, publisher as we know it today. So um, these are the, uh, the data to uh, 2010, and in a minute I will show you uh, some more update data, but uh, we talk about uh, estimated 50 million scholarly research articles published. Uh, this is the total uh, of the um, scholarly research published, 1.4 million per year. One every 22 seconds are published in the, world, in the academic world, which is amazing, one uh, for 22 seconds. Uh, Errors in a minute, I'll read. Uh, average number of science articles per journal increased in 47% from 1992 to uh, 2009. So it's, it's increasing. It's, it's a world that increases every day, every minute, every second that we talk. Um, these are the new uh, data uh, just published uh, in August 2nd. Uh, newly published research found that 28% of the academic publishing are open access, which is amazing. It's a lot, a lot of, lot of materials. If you, if you begin to think that every 22 seconds uh, an, an article is published, so think about 28%. Uh, it's a lot. Yes, now I'll read what you uh, wanted me to say. Then the question is, how highly rated are those periodicals? Uh, that do not cost the author any money. Okay, uh, well, like we say, uh, very good question, Erez. Well, um, the um, citation uh, indexes, uh, well, there are some citation indexes. This is not uh, uh, something I will talk in this webinar, but there are, I think, the main two um, big uh, citation indexes that rank uh, the periodicals, and one of them, um, which I think is the most popular one, um, he interviewed uh, last year uh, for an, uh, an academic periodical, and he said that, yes, uh, in the last five years, they do uh, uh, get, uh, comes, no, they, they try to look also on the open access um, periodicals. So they get to uh, cite them too, and they get to uh, rank them too. So uh, that is correct. Your question is very correct, because when I, for example, uh, looked where to publish my articles uh, or my PhD articles, well, I didn't go for the uh, open access one. Why? Because I was too young uh, to publish in open access because I knew uh, I, I cannot take the chance. But when you talk about uh, the exact sciences, well, over there or, or the, the uh, medicine area in, or all, all the, um, the physics, the mathematics, all the uh, SCI as we call it, well, they do open uh, access much more than we are, the humanities or the social sciences, but still uh, every, every second that we talk about it, it's still it's growing. Uh, so yes, well, we, we, we are afraid uh, that uh, people will not um, consider our article very good because we open, uh, we open access to it in, um, in a periodical who is open access. But no, uh, for now, maybe this is the situation in um, the humanities, but now in, um, in the exact sciences, well, things are better now and still growing. Um, okay, so this was uh, this article. And, um, ah, and another thing that I brought you just published a few days ago, uh, the Norwegian uh, government, the government of Norwegia, 
decided that every article now will be open published by 2024. Uh, the government goal is that all publicity funded Norwegian uh, research articles should be made openly available. And the government has established and they establish a scholarship and well if you're uh, uh, you are the author they pay, they will pay for you to publish the, uh, your article in open access which is a very 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 important initiative um, we have it this initiative we have it in Yale we have it in Harvard we have it in Princeton but um, in um, government and, and the British government also decided something uh, similar to this but now there are Norwegian government also so if you think about it in a few years, uh, the way things look uh, now, everything will be open access, funded by the government. So it will be on the orthodox periodicals, yeah, like the usual periodical that you would like to uh, publish in. But if you want to publish it um, open access, you will have to pay the publisher. Uh, by the way, why do you have to pay the publisher, if you ask yourself? When someone has to pay, as they say, most uh, today, uh, the people uh, who are reading the article, they, they pay for it. I mean, they, the, the, their libraries, their organizations, but now it shifts from the, uh, from the customers to the authors. The authors now will pay, and again, not the authors themselves, uh, their organization, now you see their governments. So I think it's a very, very good sign, very hot from the oven, this, um, this news. Um, well, if you come to think about it, nearly 50% of the content in the world, in the research world, uh, is found on major five publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Taylor and Francis and Sage. These are the five who controls, who controls the research, the academy, uh, the academic world, um, the academic literature. And of course, they, they have to strengthen, strength very hard. Uh, for us not to publish in open access because they will lose their, their hegemony. And this hegemony, um, I think it's, it comes from, uh, I don't know, 100 years, something like that. They're all very, uh, well, they're very well established in the, in the industry. So only five of them holds 50%. So think, so think about what will happen if we start to publish open access. Well, all these things will go away. It likes, it like that now it stays in, in the orthodox way. And it's soon going to change. Uh, and this is what we're talking about. Uh, the origin of open access, well, it began in the crisis in scholarly communication or publishing. Um, why? Because there were no budgets. Uh, these five um, wanted more and more money because they published more and more researches. And the, the organizations, the libraries, um, couldn't, couldn't afford it. So the, um, the material started to be less and less available uh, and libraries uh, couldn't um, buy as many as they did, I don't know, uh, a few years ago. There were more demand for newer expensive resources and they couldn't afford to buy it. And they increased the prices of serials, of periodicals, of electronic resources. These five uh, publishers, well, they stated we have much more uh, things to uh, work on. We have to uh, go digital. It, is, uh, it costs us more. Uh, so they increased the, the price. <laughs> and we had a decline of uh, the collections. So this is one of um, the crises that led to uh, the open access. Uh, the other is, is, of course, the rise of the internet and the World Wide Web. Well. Things became very, very open widely, like we we always talk about. Uh, the world now is a, is, a, is a small place that you can read everything and you can share everything. So of course, it affected also um, the academic community. So um, there were ras rapid dissemination of new research. Every like we saw, twenty two seconds, we have a new research, and better connectivity between scholars. Now, as you know, the the orthodox way is to sense. Uh, the articles between the scholars. Now, if I'm from the um, the field of uh, information science, then I can ask my colleagues in in the forums or, or in the Facebook or wherever, and to, and ask them um, to forward me their full text. Uh, but this this narrows me only to the people I know. But in open access, well, I can use the um, the scholar um, the um, Google Scholar. And I can find whatever I want. 
So uh, it's it's amazing. And then I can download it and think about uh, the possibilities you have here. Um, over 150 universities around the world mandate open access deposit of faculty. Um, like I mentioned, the, the big ones or, or the first uh, to come with these uh, statements were Harvard and Yale, Cornell, um, the, the big and the important universities in the world um, started to use it. And of course, other universities are following it. And, and we have a few uh, directories that you can go through and find your way. We'll talk about it in a minute. There are there is the, the most popular one, I think, it's the DOAJ, the Directive of Open Access Journals, which are only open access journals. It is not the orthodox journals, the open access journals. And the Directive of Open Access Repositories. Um, well, I can talk about a, a few minutes about repositories. Repositories are uh, organizational institutions like if you're a member, a faculty member in a university or a college, and um, your administ uh, administrating this organization decides that every research that comes out from their academic staff will have to be uh, on the uh, their repository, and they make their repository open access. Um, there is a bit of a problem. Um, well, it's not a problem, but uh, it's a very it's a hard thing to go through. Why? Because if you publish in the orthodox um, journals, like we do, most of us do, uh, so you have to, like I mentioned before, you have to sign that all their, they, the copyright belongs to them. So how can you open access it in a repository? Well, so there are a lot of agreements and a lot of um, restrictions, maybe to put it in a repository and only available to, I don't know, people inside the country or inside the network or something like that. Well, these things uh, does take time, but you know what? It started to work and I can, I have, I have a few uh, favorites of uh, repositories that I use and I love it. It's very easy to use, very convenient, of course, um, peer reviewed and everything. So how do we search for these open access materials? Um, there are several search engines uh, to search uh, the database. I will show today, I will demonstrate two. I think two of the, uh, yeah, I think they are the major one. Um, well, as le at least I think so. The first one is BASE. Uh, it belongs to the Bielefield Academic Search uh, uh, Academic University. Um, well, they declare that they are one of the world's most voluminous search engines, especially for academic open access web resources operated by, as I said, the university library. Um, let's see it. Um, I will just uh, copy your, uh, for you the URL so you can see it as well. Okay, here it is. Um, I will go through it uh, um, quickly. You can, uh, while I'm talking, you can browse it. Um, okay, so uh, there's this main page, as you can see, uh, there's the basic search and the advanced search, um, and you can only look for a, um, an open access material over here. Um, as you can see, there are also the advanced search, if you go to the advanced search, uh, please go to this um, tab, the advanced search. Um, see how well it is organized and, and how well can you can look for. Um, you can look in the entire document for your words or your keywords. You can look it in the title. Uh, if you know the specific author, uh, if you know the subject you're interested in, uh, you can uh, paste a, a part of a URL and you can um, limit your search uh, to document types, uh, to books, uh, to music notations, to videos to conference objects, to reports, to thesis, uh, patents, of course, articles uh, in, a sp in every language uh, you wish. And you can limit the year if you, if you um, go down, you can see the publication year and you can limit it by the year. So it is very, very um, easy source to use. And if we'll type, uh, for example, something like, uh, I'll do it in the, the title and I'll write information science. Uh, you're welcome to do it while I'm doing it. And you can see how many um, results. And they are all uh, ready for you to use. 
So it is quite um, incredible. And it is all very, very um, friendly again and uh, uh, easy to use. So I do recommend you to, to, to look it in your own free time. And I'm going back to the presentation. And just leave it open in your, uh, one of your tabs and enjoy it later. Okay, so this was the base, uh, um, the base uh, store content source. It is very, very uh, well. Now, you see, uh, last time I looked at it, uh, it had 66 million uh, documents. But <laughs> they are uh, all of them open access. Some of them have uh, some open access documents, meaning that you have to register, but still it's free, uh, free of charge. Uh, I want to go uh, with your permission to the next one, uh, which I think is the, um, well, at least I use it more often. And this is the Doaj. I will paste you uh, in a minute. Okay, here we go. This is the Doaj. The Doaj is the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, it lists journals from 116 countries. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a lot of, it's a var variety of uh, uh, places to look. Uh, you can see the search box if you're in. Okay. So uh, you see the, uh, the search box. Um, if you go down from the search box on your right, uh, uh, under the search box, you have the advanced search. Please click on it. Uh, and then you can move to this um, wonderful place. Um, that you can see all kinds of uh, um, uh, options to look for. Um, I tried, I started to search. Very, very nice. You can limit your search to journals, to articles, to subjects, um, to journal license if it is all open access or open access or um, according to authentication and things like that. Uh, by publisher, so you can see who published your article. Um, as I said, a lot of a lot of material in, in the exact science, uh, amazing. Uh, and language, etc. You can see a lot of limits that you can use, and it is very very easy to use. Um, I recommend it. Really, it's it's a very very good um, database, a very good search engine. Uh, I usually uh, uses it. Well, I use it not, well, I think parallel to uh, uh, Google Scholar. Google Scholar covers uh, a bit more, but here, everything you look for, and sometimes the things that you find here, like conferences and things like that, are not available in Google Scholar, so I recommend to use both of them uh, if you're doing your research. Okay, so um, this was the uh, Doaj, which is um, my favorite, I think and one of the, the oldest uh, um, sources uh, on the web. Uh, and now I want to introduce you to something, you know what, like hot from the oven. It started only on, on August 15, 2017, like two weeks ago. It's, an, uh, it's a brand new uh, database, uh, and I'm proud to present it here. Uh, it calls uh, thesiscommons.org. Um, let me paste for you the, the URL so we can look on it together. Okay, paste. So this is the URL, thesiscommons.org. And um, well, please go inside and uh, let's try and, and uh, find out what it is about. Please uh, roll, uh, roll down. Uh, you see the, uh, the search box. And I'm going down, down, and you can see browse by subject. Yes, uh, architecture, arts, business, education, engineering, law, life sciences, etc. Um, there are um, about uh, this um, entrepreneur. Very, very nice. The Center of Open Science is responsible for this uh, wonderful venture. And you just have to uh, type to search something. So, so feel free to, to print something. I'll print open access for you. Um, and I'll press the search. And to, well, and remember, we have only two weeks <laughs> since it, uh, we got it on the air. So it's very brand new, really. 
um, okay, so uh, the open uh, science framework and planning and management issues, I'm reading from the titles that I found. Uh, in the left-hand area, you can see, you can browse by subject and limit your subject, your specific subject. And of course, you can add your th thesis. Of course, I did it uh, um, the minute uh, I knew about this database. Um, at least I knew it, uh, I know about it uh, two weeks ago, maybe uh, it is older, but I think it's really brand new because I, I read it on the uh, someone's blog who writes only brand new things. So I have alert on him, so it's very nice. So you can uh, upload your thesis here and all the thesis that you find here. And if you please click on the, the title of the first one you found, uh, you can see that it uh, it allows you to download the thesis. Just download the thesis. And it is usually PDF or Word, uh, as you can see. I, I guess you already see it. Uh, I hope you can. So just take and download it to your, uh, to your own computer and work on it. So it allows uh, people to present their works and it allows you to uh, update yourself with new works in the area that you're interested in. You can create alerts, of course, and um, all things that you do with these kind of databases. Um, amazing source, very nice. There are a lot of sources, by the way, of uh, thesis and dissertations. Uh, today, I'll, I'll present only one of them. Uh, of course, if you'll join the course, uh, we'll talk about it um, widely and about, uh, I think we have at least one, um, one presentation only about uh, open access uh, thesis and dissertations and how to search in it and how to use it. It's, it's, it's really a very, very uh, interesting subject, very interesting subject. And, and of course you have to remember that dissertations and thesis are the main um, um, source for new and open uh, material. So it is very, very uh, important uh, for you to know and to search in it. Okay, so this was um, a, um, open uh, access thesis database only on, on a nutshell because there are so many other, but uh, I wanted you to, to get familiar with this new and brand new one. Um, okay, so let's, about, let's talk about copyright. Uh, we mentioned it before uh, about the copyright and what to do with it. So let's talk about copyright. Uh, so um, here in Creative Commons, we use the Creative Commons uh, licensing which is the uh, alternative to all right reserved. And this is the, uh, the standard license that make it easy for authors to share their work with some rights reserved. Uh, it allows authors to choose the terms of future use that balances uh, between the open access and their protection of their own work. Um, so this is the creative common. And uh, how does it work? I think I'll, I'll open it to you in a minute uh, for you to see just a minute. Uh, let's video break. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is Creative Commons? Go ahead.
Okay, so um, I think the video explained it very, very good. It's, it's really about uh, updating uh, the issue of uh, copyright uh, for the digital world. And it is very, very easy to create a Creative Commons license. You just have to uh, tick a few uh, buttons and you have your own license and you just put it inside in the end of your work and that's it. You're covered, of course, you're covered uh, only if people will pay attention to it or, or um, act uh, accordingly. Of course, there are algorithm and things like that, but uh, we're talking about uh, the uh, average um, surfer the academic surfer, of course. So uh, it is very easy to use and a very good way uh, to start using copyright in the, in the internet. Um, I added here the official website of Creative Commons for you later uh, to just uh, browse on it and to see how easy it is. Of course, there, there is a Creative Commons in every country. Uh, we have also here in Israel, but of course in every, in your own countries, you have your own Creative Commons. This is the .org, this is the uh, international one. And um, another important uh, initiative that I wanted to uh, cover before we leave this uh, subject, it's um, how to um, put the same standards uh, for the open access uh, materials. If you, can, if you come to think about it, well, um, you have this uh, very strict standards in, uh, in academic publishing. Uh, whether you use the APA or, or the MLA or whatever uh, citation rules you use, you have to be very, very precise. Uh, and think about the open access and you say, well, who will notice if I won't put this um, uh, comma or this, um, uh, um, I don't know, quotation mark or something. So this organization, the OAI, the Open Archives Initiative, um, puts on a standard uh, that aims to facilitate the fish, the Everybody does the same in the dissemination of uh, uh, freely available content. So uh, I offer here for you uh, this URL. You can uh, browse it later and see. It is very, very strict, uh, very exact. And you, when you upload your own material, whether you do it um, to archive, whether you do it to a, a, an open access journal uh, that doesn't involve in, in um, academic publishing, uh, so they do usually they go and uh, go on on your work and they recommend you to do some changes no if you do it by yourself well there are very uh, strict rules that you have to obey uh, in order to be a interoper interoperability uh, standard for all these um, wonderful uh, things called open access <clears throat> um the next subject uh, I want to discuss with you uh, very shortly, unfortunately, but still I wanted uh, to go over it. Um, it's the open data. The open data is something amazing. It's new. Um, it's a few years. Um, we call it the idea that some data should be freely available to everyone to use and republish as they wish without restriction of copyright patents or other mechanisms of control. Meaning if I collect to my data, um, I don't know, some um, data, census data or statistical data um, about um, log logs, um, use logs or uh, things about a website that uh, interests everybody. So I put it in an open data and you, one of you my, uh, guys can use it um, for another research. You can use the same data uh, for another research. This is the idea of open data, that you don't have, again, to, uh, to go over the same data and to collect it. No, because I did it already for you, so I just put it on the open data and you can reuse it. Of course, you have to mention that you took it uh, from uh, who originally um, uh, did it, the first one, but still, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Uh, people share and use open data all around the world. Uh, we don't have enough time to discuss this, but I just want to show you in a nutshell, uh, let's uh, see a video, a very nice video uh, on it. Uh, in a minute. Let's video. Okay.
Okay. So um, I have another uh, video, but I won't show it to you because I want to go on. But um, the thing about open data, uh, it's it's a new growing subject. It is amazing. Uh, one of our uh, um, presentations in this course, uh, we talk a lot of uh, resources of open data. Some of them are governmental, some of them organizational, some of them private. And you can actually go inside the data. You have data sheets in Excel, um, of course, in other uh, applications that uh, I'm, I can't always uh, find out what it is, but uh, I guess people uh, who uses it knows how to use it. Uh, you go inside um, amazing places and you can download your uh, the data and you can reuse it and you can manipulate it. It is, I think, it's something that uh, creates a, a new world of uh, research, a new world of research, um, and it is amazing in my eyes. Okay, so this was the open data. It may include non-textual materials such as maps, genomes, con connectomes, chemical compounds, mathematical and scientific formulas, medical data, practice, etc. cetera. Uh, open data initiatives in various subjects like open, ac on open science data is one of the, the biggest, open government, and we are talking about it uh, very specifically uh, in our course. Amazing things that you can do with open data, really. Um, I just added, uh, before we leave this subject, I just added for you uh, one of the best um, resources for open data. It calls Open Data Handbook, um, and it explains the basic policies. It has presentations on it. It has resources on it, and um, I really recommend you to go inside this amazing resource. It's uh, from Open Knowledge uh, International, and just look uh, on it. And of course, uh, in our course, we'll, we'll talk about it very specifically. Um, and before I, I leave this uh, specific subject, uh -huh, I just love something like the, the Open Science Prize, that there are initiatives of open data and everyone can vote. Uh, you know, we have it on YouTube every year. We have it on Facebook, uh, all the, the best posts, the best uh, YouTuber. But this one, it's the best open uh, data source, uh, amazing uh, um, projects. Uh, around the competition, very nice. Uh, just uh, I, I put on for you the URL. You can just use it and enjoy it. Um, you're not uh, um, asking questions. If someone wants to ask questions, go ahead. I'm here and I can see it. Um, let's talk about um, courses and open courses. Um, in a minute, we'll go about the MOOC, of course. But before the MOOC, um, I will go over the OER, which is the Open Educational Resources. Uh, this is the, um, I think, the more um, well, old one. Well, um, it, this one, I, I think, it's about uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it started in um, in a few very distinguished uh, universities uh, in the U.S. Uh, you can see here uh, the Cornell, the MIT, and they just uh, uh, uploaded. Uh, could you please post in the comments uh, the link to your book? It sounds interesting. Um, okay, let's go. You mean the book of uh, Open Data Handbook, right? In a minute, I'll do it for you. Yes, okay, just a minute. Okay. Okay, here you are, and thank you for this remark. Okay, um, so where were we? Oh, okay. So we were talking about uh, um, MIT. Uh, uh, we we're talking about Carnegie Mellon and a few more uh, very, very distinguished uh, universities. Um, uh, this open courseware they just uploaded uh, their course contents, like presentations, assignments. Um, textbooks, whatever they had uh, in class. Uh, it started, as I said, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, again, you have here the, the URLs, so uh, you can browse it yourself. This is the, the mother and the father of this, of this phenomenon. Uh, can you please post this link here? Ah, but you have it, you can uh, copy it. Um, well, if you ask, Raya, I will do it for you. Okay, just a minute. 
Okay. So uh, the open course where I'll go to, I'll do the MIT one, okay, which is, I think, um, it's the better one, uh, better than Carnegie Mellon. It goes by department, uh, very nice. Okay, here you are. This is the MIT. Okay, I'm gonna shut some, um, close some tabs. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and if we're here, I'll upload also the Carnegie Mellon so no one will um, accuse me of uh, preferring one on, on the other, which is, uh, also a very good one. Uh, by the way, a very, very good uh, source uh, for teachers. Amazing source for teachers. Okay. And uh, we have in our course, by the way, uh, one of the presentations. Uh, you're most welcome. Um, Renana. Okay, so uh, one of the um, presentations that we have in the course, we're talking specifically about um, source resources for teachers amazing things guys you won't believe uh, the things that you can use uh, from the web uh, in different languages and, and with uh, specific search engines that you can use and you can manipulate your search to find uh, the specific things that you want uh, for a specific job subjects uh, amazing things again we're to we'll talk about it uh, uh, in our course uh, in our um, in the information literacy course. Okay, so um, like I said, the, the open courseware was the, the father and the mother of these uh, massive open online courses that you probably all want, uh, pass. Uh, Coursera, also great for teaching. Oh, of course, and we're just coming to it, Paz. So just stay tuned. We're just coming to it, yes, of course. Um, you're right. Um, I mentioned this one and, and I mentioned, um, uh, specifically the, the search engines I'm using uh, because uh, it is the, invis um, the invisible web. Uh, the MOOCs are now uh, more available to everybody, but uh, in our course, we're talking about the invisible web, the things that most people and most teachers, are for, unfortunately, doesn't know and doesn't uh, get familiar with. And amazing, no, I really mean it, amazing search engines, very nice. Okay. So let's go on. Um, so we are talking about the MOOCs. Um, and again, I thought uh, to myself that most of you probably know the MOOCs. Uh, maybe you, uh, you did uh, one or two MOOCs. Uh, so let's talk about uh, definition first. Uh, it's a course of study made available over the internet without charge uh, to a very large number of people. Now, when I talk, when I'm mentioning very large number of people, well, um, guys, I, I joined one of them, one of the MOOCs. Uh, it was on um, Harvard. It was amazing, by the way, amazing to learn from the, the specialist, amazing. And uh, we were uh, 350 people around the world. We did assignments. Um, and if you want to ask me who, uh, who went through my assignment, well, uh, uh, my peers, the peers in the course, we all uh, needed to, um, to go and check uh, one another work, and we graded it. Uh, it was an amazing uh, experience, really, I, I recommend it. But uh, you have to uh, uh, be very um, obliged to it. You have to go uh, through the end because it's, it really takes a lot of time, a lot of work, but it's amazing. I, I loved it, and I do hope I will have a, a, a more time to do another one. It is. So anyone who decides to take a MOOC simply logs onto the website and signs up. And then he's inside and he can use it and he can, uh, you have every week or every two weeks, there is a presentation and an assignment. And usually you have to check uh, one, uh, one another assignment. Like I said, uh, your peers um, go through your assignments. Uh, these are recent development of, uh, in distance education, which began to emerge in 2012. Uh, by the way, one of the initiatives um, in Coursera is an Israeli uh, researcher. Um, we have it, uh, YouTube for you. Uh, let's see if we have time for it. Maybe uh, uh, for part of it, minute. I'll put it on for you. Uh, 
Okay, go ahead and I'll stop it in the middle. Look about the numbers, huh? Amazing. Okay, I'm stopping here because uh, I want to go on and we have a deadline. Um, so the MOOCs are uh, really, really a phenomena, uh, really phenomena. And you have, a, I don't know, a lot of people using it in the same time. Um, as you see, in additional uh, to traditional course materials such as videos and readings, MOOCs provide interactive user forums that help build a community for students and professors. And it was amazing when I used, uh, when I joined uh, the MOOC I took, well, we had a forum and it was so active, like, and you know what, it was 24 hours active because all around the globe, people were just asking questions and people were answering. And it was really a community of students for this course. Amazing, really. Uh, I put on for you, I think, yeah, well, this is an infographic uh, of the MOOC. Very nice. So massive open online course um, for you to, uh, to observe. Very uh, nice. Uh, I put on some uh, course example for you, but you know what? You don't have to use it. Uh, this one I want you to use, and I'll, I'll put the URL for you. Uh, this amazing resource just uh, let you uh, browse all the resources for MOOC that you have today on the web. Amazing. It calls MOOC provider, as you have, a, of course, Coursera, and all its um, uh, peers. Um, I think like thousands of courses right under your hand. Uh, this is also an app for Class Central. Oh, amazing. I didn't know that. Well, good to know. Thank you, Paz. Pass the rights. Uh, oh, it's new. Amazing. Also an application for Class Central. Very, very good. Well, you know what? Uh, it is obvious. It, it should have been and it's obvious. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, to to learn about it and to know that um, you can use it in classrooms as well. And by the way, um, my uh, uh, my son is learning physics, um, and they did MOOC last year. They did it in the in a whole semester of MOOC. Instead of going to the class, uh, they had it in um, you know in their uh, in the multimedia class, and they did a MOOC. Uh, and it was amazing to see his his reaction not to do it uh, frontally, and to have an assignment, an, an English assignment, he talks Hebrew, an English assignment, and he did it, and it was, oh, it was uh, very nice, very nice. They, I think they did a Cornell one. Uh, very, very interesting, very interesting. Um, okay, so how do we know about uh, the courses and register? Well, again, I put uh, on here a list for you, another resource that you can browse by the subject you're interested in. Uh, and you can use it. Uh, and I put also here um, a Facebook uh, that you can uh, uh, look for and uh, have recommendations. Okay, here we are. So uh, running out of time, 
So, um, guys, these uh, subjects that we went through this uh, webinar are only a small portion of our uh, comprehensive course. All the course talks about information literacy, and the idea is to learn as a workshop concept, um, which is brand new and very nice, I think. Uh, what we do, um, we have uh, presentations, and then we have assignments and online assignments. Very nice. You have to search uh, for things. Um, we do peer review. We do presentations. Uh, it will concentrate on acquiring and practicing search skills and getting familiar with important information sources, not through the popular search engines. Of course, we'll go through Google. Of course, we'll go through Yahoo. But now, I want you to know and get familiar with the invisible web like we did today. Amazing places to go uh, just by uh, a click of uh, the mouse. Uh, very, very, very nice things to look for. A few administrative details before we uh, we end. The duration of the course is 14 weeks. Uh, we go through presentations and then we have a guided search assignments. Uh, very interested. Uh, by the way, everyone gets to search their own uh, um, um, subject of interest. Uh, we'll have two synchronic uh, meetings. Uh, and you'll get graduation diploma from Ofet International Institute. The tuition fee is uh, $250. and uh, you guys will get a $50 uh, reduction uh, for uh, taking this webinar. Um, so uh, I'll conclude by hope you enjoyed uh, this class and uh, I had an, a nice time with you and I thank you for participating. Got to say good night. Thanks for all the helpful information. I really appreciated it. Well, thank you, Rez, and I enjoyed your uh, being here with us. And um, guys, hope to see you uh, and meet you in uh, our course. I want to thank Ricky. Yes, I want to thank Ricky. You're welcome, Cassie and Renana. And Paz, good night. Thank you. You too. And uh, in the coming uh, days, we'll send you a recording of the webinar. And the more information about the uh, course that uh, Ricky described, uh, the course is uh, part of our ICT and education program, and uh, we will send you more details about uh, this program, and uh, we hope uh, to see you uh, as uh, one of our students. Uh, if you have any question, you can uh, write or to me. But thank you for joining us, and uh, have a good day.